get your your, uh, your go nitro and let's get going. Okay, uh, a couple things I want to uh, review with you before we get down to the physics part of class, and that is um, we have a I, I want to go over the week ahead and actually two weeks. Um, until the final. The final exam, as you know from the syllabus, uh, is at 10 o'clock a.m. on uh, Tuesday, April 30th. Now, that's two weeks from today. So you're going to have a huge amount of time to study. And I have no control over the uh, exam schedule, so I didn't choose that day. But um, it works out if you need extra time to study. I mean, you may have other classes that you, you know, are worried about and you want to study for. Now, let's take a look at the entire schedule uh, in the week ahead. Here's kind of a slice of the calendar. And starting with today, lecture 27, regular lecture today. We'll have some clicking here in a minute. Uh, and then office hours tomorrow, of course. And then the last lecture of the semester is lecture 28. And in this lecture uh, 28, uh, we will have um, at the last mm, 20, 30 minutes, we'll have a little clicking um, review set. So uh, it, and it's a, it's effectively like a little mini study guide for the final. Just something to, to review and you'll work on it. You'll work on it the way we do exams, self-paced polling, but you'll be able to work with your neighbors and stuff. So you form a little study group and just, you know, work on stuff together. And that'll be the last 20, 30 minutes of lecture on Thursday. That clicking review, I will convert, you know, 15 or 20 points, whatever it is, and I'll convert that down to three or four bonus points or fewer. If you do. Hopefully everybody does good on it. And you'll have some bonus points. Now that's going to cover over, um, let's say you get three out of the four bonus points. That's going to cover up three points of smelliness, that you may have in your exam grades or on your homework. I mean, say, or your cl your regular clicking. You know, if you if you went like three weeks without your clicker, your clicker grade, your participation grade is going to be a little low, but this will help cover it up. The other thing we have is, um, you know, we'll be having regular homework. Uh, that weekend we'll have a regular homework assignment over the stuff we talk about in lecture uh, 28. Uh, and then we'll also have a mega review homework in web courses, and that'll be 15 or 20 uh, questions to work on, you know, so another little mini review to get you studied. And that will be due the morning of the final. So you can work on it all the way up to the final. And I'll give you like 10 attempts or whatever. There'll be some calculations in it, you know, like maybe a thermal equilibrium and, uh, you know, stopping distance and, uh, you know, maybe uh, a wavelength calculation or some, you know, some mixture of those um, to practice on uh, during study week. And this last day of classes on campus is next Monday. And then study day. And then that following Wednesday, so two uh, weeks from tomorrow, two Wednesdays from now, I'll have expanded off. So in other words, maybe two or three office hours. Uh, so that's that. Now, the, the, when I was writing up this little slice of calendar uh, at the time, this was the big question. You know, where is the SI study uh, union going to be and when? But breaking news, uh, Monday, April 22nd, so that's a week from yesterday, next Monday, uh, 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. in the Garden Key Room in the Student Union. All right, and that's usually super helpful. And um, even if you could only make a half hour, you know, like from 3 to 3.30, do it. All right. And that's the last day of classes. So if you have classes... Hopefully you can at least slice off 30 minutes of this, um, you know, where you, you know, where you can attend for even 30 minutes. That'll be helpful. Plus, you can make friends there at the at the study union, and you know, maybe find a study partner to you know help you out for the last week. Okay. Any questions about any of that stuff? Yes, Daniel. I 
Yes. So do you have an announcement? Yes. Stand up. Okay. Face the jury of your peers. Okay. Make your announcement. Okay. So hi everyone. Um, my name is Daniel, and uh, you know, uh, in case anyone, um, in case anyone like wants to study or anything, uh, you can just just ask me. Um, I I posted. Um, I created a discussion of web courses. Um, it's it's um, labeled final exam, so so just look for that. And then you can send me a message in there, or um, also uh, there's a group chat for the class. Yes, but I don't encourage that. Yeah, I know. And so, but anyways, uh, so Daniel's study uh, sessions I I hear are helpful. So. That's public service, a PSA, a public service announcement from Daniel Moreno. Thank you, Daniel. All right. So uh, let me just reinforce, uh, we will have clicking. Uh, we'll have some today in class. We'll have some Thursday, and then we'll, we'll have an additional set of clicking for the review set. So we're going to have a lot of clicking this week. Now, the, the last official clicking of the semester will be Thursday, before we do the review, the review clicking will be it will be going into bonus points. So um, we also have homework this week, and we'll have homework over the weekend, um, and uh, and so that'll go into your homework scores as well. Now, also this week we have, of course, today 2:30 um, in the teaching academy, some SI activity, and then tomorrow, three o'clock in business at mid one. So. And hopefully you can make some of these SI sessions. Uh, and if you haven't done so, uh, please um, uh, get in there and try it. Now, I want to give you a clicker question here. So let's, let's just do this. Um, here we go. Give me your answer, A, B, C, D, or E, for this question, please. Oh, there's a, I see, good, okay, uh, 15 seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, let me stop this. Uh, yeah, and uh, just so that you can see, a uh, few people voted for E. Okay, good. Uh, you rocket scientist wannabes out there. Very, that's very nice. I can see who did it, too. I can look it up. I can look at anything in the raw data file, anyway. All right. So that's just a little a clicker question for today. Um, I want to talk about uh, getting back to physics. We're now... We're now in our target. We're in our target zone. We're flying over the target. The target is the periodic table. And today we're putting it in, we're putting in the concepts that we need. We're going to start by talking about neon. Now, if you've been out driving at night, you've seen a zillion neon signs like this one. All right. And neon signs, you know, this one's the reddish orangish part is the neon. The bluish part is, uh, I don't know what that is, maybe nitrogen or something. But the reddish-orange uh, color, this is a pure neon-filled uh, gas tube. And it's, you know, we're going to be doing some uh, demonstrations and observations on Friday, or excuse me, Thursday, uh, of neon and hydrogen. Um, and so if you, you put a, a glass tube, you fill it with pure ne uh, neon gas, and then you zap it with some high voltage, it'll emit this uh, distinctive uh, color, kind of orangey red. Now, here's what we want to tackle today. 
And everybody's seen neon lights of that kind. If you put that light through a spectrum, it'll split up into its colors. And this is what it looks like. Okay. The, this is the visible, and we, we call this a discrete spectrum. D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E. -E, discrete. In other words, it's not continuous. It's not all the colors of the rainbow. There's a lot of colors on here. And you can see most of them are down here in the reds, yellows, and oranges. Okay. But there's a little bit of blue in there, some green. You know. Now, sunlight, if you put it through a prism or a diffraction grating, you'll get a rainbow. You'll get all the color, all the colors of the rainbow, as the saying goes. Right. But if you have pure neon under high voltage like this, it will produce only specific colors. You can count them. Okay, there's a lot of them, but they can be counted, you know, with a precise a spectrograph is what we call that. And uh, uh, it is not continuous like a, like a, you know, if you just, if you were to look at one of the incandescent lights in this room, you know, through a prism, you'd see a rainbow, okay? And, or a diffraction grating, you'd see a rainbow on the left, you'd see one on the right. Uh, but with neon, you won't. And I'll bring those in on Thursday, at least two, one or two uh, tubes, hydrogen and neon for sure. And you can see it with a diffraction grating. It looks pretty cool. Now, uh, this is what we call discrete. In other words, it's countable. It's not continuous, right, like the rainbow. Sunlight, rainbow. Incandescent light, rainbow. Pure neon, discrete, like this. <laughs> And uh, now, if you look, so that's, that's neon. Now, if you look at any element, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, neon, iron, they're all here, you can see that they have different spectral lines. That's what we call these, because we, we produce this spectrum, the discrete spectrum, by shining light through a diffraction grating. And the, the openings in the diffraction grating are, are it's like, the bars on a jail, uh, the door to a jail cell, you know, they're vertically aligned like that. So the light going through makes vertical uh, linear images like this. So we call them spectral lines. And you can see hydrogen up there at the top. That's the one that we're going to study today. But helium, that's right below it. Oxygen, neon, which we already looked at. And there's iron. And you can do this for all the elements. Also, if you have infrared um, optics, you can spot in, you know, lines further to the right in the infrared. And if you have ultraviolet optics, you can spot lines further to the left over here past the, the violet end. Okay, so, but this is the visible, this is the Roy G. Biv discrete spectrum or discrete spectra of all these elements here. Now, here's what hydrogen looks like. This is what a hydrogen lamp looks like to the naked eye. It's kind of pinkish, almost a, you know, almost a, uh, a reddish pinkish color. And make a note to yourself, I have some videos in the Physical Science 1121 area that are labeled, uh, there's, a, there's a playlist called Diffraction. And I have several videos of that. Now, they're not as good as this, and they're not as precise as this, but you can see the, the very spectral lines of hydrogen. So this is the naked eye image, all right? This is what you see with your eyeball. If you put it through a prism or diffraction grating, this is what hydrogen looks like, all right? Now, I want you to kind of make a sketch here, and instead of sketching in the, you don't have colored pens, but you can write down, you know, like for this one, red. Um, and then for this one, kind of aqua, greenish aqua. Okay, it's kind of between the blues and the greens, so it's kind of an aqua-ish color. And then down here, let me turn off. No, you can see it. Down here, there's a couple purpley blue lines. Now, Thursday, we'll see those. And we can get this room really dark and nice, and you'll be able to see those. There's actually two of them down there, okay, they're, and they're really close together. And those are the four specific discrete spectral lines of hydrogen. Now, they all have names. This reddish one is famous H-alpha, hydrogen alpha. 
and uh, this aqua one, H beta or hydrogen beta. And then down here, there's two of them, H gamma and H delta, to signify um, you know, the fact that we've got two down there. And you'll see them uh, on, on Thursday. Uh, but these, these specific um, spectral lines, they're, they're the, the, like the quantum fingerprints of hydrogen. When we see a star emitting a lot of these four colors, or three out of these four, you know, because sometimes not all of them are, are, are emitted at, at certain temperatures, you know, but if you see the surface of a star emitting a lot of this stuff, you can say to yourself, yep, we've got a lot of hydrogen. And guess what? Most of the universe is, uh, the vi most of the visible universe is this stuff, hydrogen. We see a lot of H alpha, H beta, H gamma, H delta. And we see, and there's, there's ultraviolet off the left end over here, and there's infrared. I think hydrogen's got some infrared as well off the right end, right? And so we can see those in the infrared um, telescopes and the ultraviolet telescopes. All right, and those, so those are the, like the quantum fingerprints. And what they do is they actually encode or reveal to us now that we know the principles of electrical potential energy, they um, allow us to figure out um, how tightly bound an electron is to the nucleus of, of hydrogen, which is just a single proton. And that is important because the binding of electrons controls all of the periodic table and all of chemistry. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the specs. Now, here's the um, a table of wavelengths and frequencies. 656 nanometers, yeah, we've already done that. We did that a couple weeks ago when we calculated frequency from a 656 red uh, beam of light, the H alpha. Uh, H -ac uh, or the uh, the aqua, aqua line is H beta, and that's about 486. And so what we do is, you know, we put it through, a, you know, like a prism or diffraction grating in the lab, and then we measure the angles, you know, because it won't go straight through. The, the, the reds will be off to a certain angle, and then the purples off to a certain angle. We measure those angles. We measure distances to the screen where we're observing it, do a little bit of trig, and we can figure out the wavelength. It's not too bodacious. Um, and then here's the two purpley blues, H gamma and H delta, 434 and 410. 410 we did, I think we did that on homework. Uh, or maybe, I think we, actually, I think we did a clicker question with 410 nanometers, and we figured out 732, all right? So that's just the, you know, thing, uh, a, a list of the, you know, some of the properties of the discrete visible spectra of hydrogen. Now, there's a fancy name for this series of colors, these four colors. These are known as the Balmer series. Let me spell that for you. Uh, B-A-L-M-E-R, and it's named after the guy that figured out the pattern in wavelengths, all right? So this question, why isn't the hydrogen lamp like a hot light bulb? You know, a hot light bulb, continuous spectrum. Pure hydrogen uh, in, a, in a glass tube and then zapped with high voltage, only these four colors in the visible. So why don't we get a continuous rainbow? Why only these colors? Is, and, and, and basically that's, that's like saying, is there a pattern of any kind in the wavelength or frequency? Now, if you look at those wavelengths and frequencies, you know, you don't have frequency doubling, you know, so it's 457 and then 617 terahertz and 691, you know, you're not really getting you know, like, or multiply by three or divide by three. You're not getting anything like that. Same thing with wavelengths. The wavelengths are not getting, they're getting smaller, but they're not getting smaller like, you know, one over two, one over four, one over eight, or nothing like that. All right, so we, we're, we you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult pattern. The guy that figured it out is named Joseph Balmer, B-A-L-M-E-R. And here's the pattern that he found. It's a pattern in the inverse wavelength. So 1 over lambda obeys this uh, property. Now, R is called the Rydberg constant, and I'll give you the spelling for that and the value of it in a second. But Joseph Balmer was working with this thing, and he, for some reason, 
you know, this is back in the 1800s, before Einstein, before Planck, before all these guys. Uh, and he, he worked it out mathematically. You know, he's, he checked lambdas, he checked frequencies. Then I guess he decided, let me check inverse wavelength. So he did all the one over lambdas. And then he found this pattern that if you, if you take one over four and subtract one over n for these values of n, three, four, five, and six, you'll get the inverse wavelength of H alpha, H beta, H gamma, H delta. Okay. And, you know, so here's the, here's the pattern. Okay. There it is. There's, there's the, that's the Balmer formula. R is called the Rydberg constant. There's a spelling for it. For hydrogen, its value is 1.097 times 10 to the 7, and then meters to the minus 1. That means that's the same as inverse meters. Okay. And that's because this is a wavelength of inverse meter. It's a wave, it's a, excuse me, it's a formula of inverse meters. And the Balmer formula says if you want 1 over lambda, use 1.097 times 10 to the 7 inverse meters and then multiply it by the square brackets. Now figure out your square brackets. And we're going to do this in a second. Okay, I'll, I'll do, we'll do n equals 6 together. All right. So that's the formula. And hydrogen, uh, different elements, not all elements obey this, but hydrogen does. There are certain elements that approximately obey it. And they have their own Rydberg constant. But for hydrogen, it's 1.097. And I have a famous uh, problem with this kind of a calculation, but for an element that is called chuctanium, discovered by Chuck Norris. So you'll see that in homework, maybe. And it's a similar Rydberg or a similar Balmer formula. Now, let's do n equals 6. All right, so what you do with n equals 6 and this is going to give us H uh, delta, the wavelength of H delta. You put in uh, 1 over 6 where it says uh, and. So you put in 1 over 6 squared. Um, and, and you put in your Rydberg constant. Okay. So here there's the first line of this equation block, your Rydberg constant. And then a square brackets, 1 over 2 to the second. That's 1 over 4. And let me get my cursor over here. Okay, so here's 1 over 6 squared. All right, so this is doing the n equals 6 level of that table. This is h delta, all right? And then, uh, then at this point, if you're doing it on paper, if you're doing it on a calculator and you know how to do fractions, you can do it without too much trouble. But if you're doing it on paper, you've got to go to common denominators. So common denominators for 4th and ninth fractions, no, 4th and 36 fractions, it's 36. So 1 fourth the same, is the same as 9 over 36. So that's this one here. First item in the square brackets on the uh, uh, third or on the, on the middle equation. Uh, and then 1 over 36, we haven't changed that one. Okay. So now we can, now that we have common denominators over here, we can go 9 minus 1, and that gives me 8. And so 8 over 36. Now, you could reduce that to 2 over 9, uh, or you could just, you know, leave it there and calculate. And when you calculate, so you could go 8 times 1 of 0 0.097, EE7, and then divide by 36, and you'll get this number, 2.48, 2.438, I should say, times 10 to the 6 inverse meters. Okay. Now we're gonna we're gonna turn that into that. That's one over lambda, right? So we're not done yet. We're, we're gonna flip flop it to get lambda itself. But let me pause for questions here. Raise your hand if you have a question at any step. I don't want to leave anybody in the dust. Because I know. All kinds of people love fractions. So you love fractions? Yeah. Okay. But you still have a question, right? Go ahead. It's Diana, right? Okay. Finally, I learned some more names. Yeah, I just, I just, I just mentioned that. How would you do it in your calculator? 
1.097 EE7 and then times 8 and then divide by 36. You know, or or do 8 over 36 equals and then multiply by 1.097 EE7, you know. So just mess around with it, you know, see the way that you like to do it. You might have to do a Balmer series calculation on the final. I'm not saying what's going to be on the final, but I'm just saying. It goes without saying. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. I don't want to put too much pressure on you because this is getting into scientific. Yeah, this is getting into nuclear physics now. So go ahead. Two point four three eight. I'm just using scientific notation. That's the same as two million three hundred forty four hundred thirty eight thousand, which is what you got, right? Okay. Yeah. So you're good. Yeah. What you have, you're you're in floating. If you convert your thing over to scientific, you'll it'll work out that way. Come up after lecture if we have a few minutes, and I'll show you how to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now we got to flip flop that if we want to get land itself. You know, and put that in the table. We've got to flip-flop that. So now on most calculators, there's a one over button. Sometimes it says X to the minus one. All right? And it might be a second button. All right. So you flip-flop that. So here's what you got. And you flip-flop that. That's like going one over 2.438 times 10 to the 6 uh, meters to the minus one. So now your answer is going to be in a, you know, Point four, you know, four or point, yeah, point four uh, t times ten to the minus six. So we gotta, we gotta do a little bit of work here. Here's what if if you, if you do it on your calculator, it comes out looking like that. All right, now you gotta. We want to move the decimal point. We're gonna try to get um, nanometers here. Okay, so let's see if we can move this thing over nine places. Okay, so we'll move our decimal point over nine places, and that works out to 410.2 uh, nanometers, and that's H uh, delta, okay? Now let me pause for questions here. Are you good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, I highly recommend, let me repeat, I highly recommend that you get facility and get, get some skills with uh, scientific notation on a calculator, not on the cell phone. On a cell phone you can practice with, but you got to know how to do it on, on your calculator because you can't use a cell phone on the final. So here's kind of a wrap on the Balmer series. The observable regularity of the Balmer series uh, must indicate some unseen regularity in the atom itself. And um, that concept, my wonderful students, cannot be overemphasized. The fact that there's a numerical pattern, you know, that's like Galileo's conviction that the, that the world, you know, the universe is an open book and that it's, it's a book written in a language of mathematics. So Balmer figured out one of the mathematical sentences of the universe. And so that must correspond to some F equals MA or, you know, some kind of EPE question or rule. All right. And that's what we're going to try to try to uh, tackle today. Now, before we uh, take off from that, here's what the sun spectrum looks like. And these little gaps that you see in the rainbow, uh, they symbolize, it, it, for the sun, the sun is incandescent, so it produces a rainbow. The atmosphere above the sun, however, will absorb certain colors. And because it, so the, the hydrogen atoms floating around in the atmosphere above the sun, They'll absorb a lot of, you know, like this big red gap down here. 
This might be uh, H alpha down here. I'm not sure, but it might be H alpha. Those hydrogen atoms up in the atmosphere will absorb that. You know, it's it, it, the the H alpha color coming off the sun um, it, as part of the rainbow. The other reds will go buzzing right past, but that one will get absorbed. Okay, and I'll show you why atoms absorb colors of light. So these are what we call absorption features. Absorption features. In other words, places where a color is missing. And these are equivalent to fingerprints as well. So if we see a star spectrum and we see H alpha, H beta, and H gamma missing, we know, okay, that star's got a lot of hydrogen. It's hot. It's producing a continuous spectrum because it's incandescent. But it's also got some atomic hydrogen floating around, and, uh, and those, the, those will be the fingerprints of it. Now, here's a picture of a very famous nebula out in the universe called the Rosette Nebula. And this is in the, using a filter for 656 nanometer red light. And so this is what the uh, Rosette Nebula looks like if you only look through uh, a filter for that color. Okay, it filters out all the other colors. But there's other colors out there, and there's other substances out there. And uh, the Rosette Nebula, um, actually, here's a false color image. Now, this one is, it, it measures, what they did here was they measured the spectral lines of sulfur. You know, sulfur's got its own spectral lines. And then they false colored that red. So the reddish parts here are from sulfur. Oxygen, uh, the greenish areas that you can see here, uh, and oxygen, I don't think oxygen comes through as green to the eye. Uh, but they, 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 used an oxygen filter, and then false-colored it uh, green. And then the H-alpha filter, they false-colored that blue. Uh, so that's the, uh, the rosette. So you, we, we use this as a tool. And we identify stuff, you know, even in some distant nebula, you know, millions of light years away. And we can see this thing. And here's another nebula. This is a, this is a famous one, the supernova remnant in Taurus. Uh, and this is an H-alpha. And so what we're going to do now is talk about the quantum theory of the hydrogen atom. And, you know, this one, you know, this is a supernova remnant. In other words, it's a, a large star, you know, many times larger than the sun that eventually it burns brightly, burns quickly, and then reaches the end of its lifetime and then blows itself up in a supernova detonation. And these are the smithereens flying outward from the detonation. And it's a lot of hydrogen, it's still hot. So it's emitting. Um, anyway, so let's look at hydrogen. Here's a simplified view of hydrogen now. I mentioned that the different colors, H alpha, H beta, and so on, reveal to us the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. And we're, we're basically talking about EPE. So the theory is that only because there's a few colors, only a few orbits are allowed. Right, and the electron only lives at certain altitudes, certain orbits, and no others. And that's why we don't have a, a rainbow. We only have a discrete spectrum. All right, and each altitude has a set electrical potential energy. Right, so the discrete means we have a, a set of orbits. And you can count them, starting with the lowest level, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, and on up. All right, so countable energy levels. And so, the, so this, is the, this is what we call the, um, the Bohr um, model of the hydrogen atom, discovered by or developed by Niels Bohr from Denmark. And Albert Einstein uh, added some uh, finishing touches to it. Okay, so for instance... Um, so there's my energy levels. So if you look at n equals 3 and n equals 2, you know, n equals 3 is going to be a lot of uh, potential energy and n equals 2 a little bit less, okay? But instead of converting to uh, kinetic energy, what happens is um, it emits a photon. So the electron emits a photon. 
as it deorbits. So from n equals three down to n equals two, they worked it out. That's the H alpha. When when an electron goes from the third energy level down to the second, that's just the right energy for an H alpha photon. And they're just the right wavelength, just the right color for the H alpha. So this little transition here from n equals three down to n equals two, and bang, a red H alpha photon is emitted, all right? And now your, your electron's down there at n equals two, and guess what? If, if there's an H alpha incoming, it can bump the electron back up to n equals three. Go ahead and make a note of that. The reverse process is also possible. If you get a red H alpha in, it'll bump that electron from n equals two up to n equals three. Nice. And now when it, when it decides to drop back down, it, electrons always want to drop back down to the lowest energy level. They'd like to get down to n equals one. Uh, and so you bump it up with an incoming H alpha, and a short time later, it'll zip down, it'll deorbit to n equals two, and emit another H, H alpha, a nice red one. Right? Now, the guys that figured this out uh, figured, okay, number of the orbits, electron drops down to a lower EPE, the missing energy, the delta EPE, goes into the photon. Now, how does the photon get that energy? Well, the guys that figured that out uh, were Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein. Uh, and they figured out the photon energy from the countable quantized atomic energy levels. And here's the formula that Einstein proposed, that the energy of the photon is Planck's constant H times the frequency of the photon. So if you think about it, you know, you're looking at, you know, the discrete spectrum of hydrogen. And you say, all right, if I can figure out the frequency, I can figure out the energy if Einstein is right. So I go into the lab, I measure, do a little bit of trig, some Pythagorean theorem and stuff. You guys, if, if we had a lab class, for a lab for this class, which we were supposed to have, uh, you guys could measure hydrogen just like that, just like Niels Bohr and Einstein. It's not hard. You guys, it's, it's really just a bunch of right triangles and stuff to get the wavelength. And then to get the frequency, you go, you, you see equals lambda F. You know, you figure out the frequency, the wave equation for electromagnetic radiation. And then once you have the frequency, bang, you use the energy formula, E equals HF. And what that tells you, that's the energy of the photon. And what that tells you is the change of electric potential energy for the electron. Right? So Einstein says, yeah, e equals HF for a photon. Everybody knows that. And so let's assume that that's the change in the electrical potential energy from the, for the electron that emits it. Okay, the electron loses so many joules of energy or so many electron volts of energy. Um, and so that means um, the outgoing photon has that same amount of energy and therefore a certain frequency, certain wavelength, certain color. And as I've mentioned before, um, Planck's constant is essential to this. And, and this is why I always say, you know, the Planck's constant, the one constant to rule them all. It is involved in every single physical transaction. When you taste something, a strawberry milkshake, you smell something, you know, smoke coming from a campfire. When you see something in your eye, the retina, you know, when you hear something, you know, your, your nerve impulses going from your eardrum all the way up into your coconut. All those things are, are, are ruled by, you know, chemical reactions and physical interactions, and H is in every single one of them, all right?
oh my goodness. That's all I want to say today. We went so f Does anybody want to go back and, and go over something? Or do you want to dismiss early today? Dismiss early? I, I, I You know, I usually put 33, 30 slides, and I put in 33 today, and we just went so fast, and it's only 11.19. Okay, I'll give you a short hydrogen homework tonight. I'll, in fact, I'll do it right now. Um, and, yeah, uh, – SI and SI Study Union, uh, and I'll see you tomorrow for office hours, tomorrow morning, if you can make it. Okay, you're dismissed. Wow, a fast lecture for once. If you have any questions about stuff, come on up. You want to check with the calculator? No, you you got it squared away? How do we study for the final? Study for the final? How do you do How that? How should we do that? Study everything, my friend. Lectures, Study YouTube's. Um, double check your lectures against YouTube. That's always a good technique. Um, go over the clicker questions. Go over the homework questions. All right. And because you know the clicker questions, well, except the the di dipsy one I put in today. But the uh, you know most of the time we have a clicker question about a calculation or a concept or something. It's in there because I think it's important. And there because it's important, it might be on the final. Um, same thing with homework, because I'm not going to, I only have a certain amount of homework I can give you guys without you guys totally, you know, frying your brains. So I only have to give you stuff that's important. So, so if it's on homework. Know every problem to know everything from the yeah, day. basically know everything. Yeah. For, for the first day. <laughs> Nothing much, just know everything. But I mean, to, 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 to the priority should be lecture. That has priority. And then priority one and a half is clicking and homework questions. Okay. Okay. And then prior to number two is anything else you can read about any topic that we've had. Okay, thank you. All right, man. Good. Hi. Yeah. Um, I know we only had one clicker question today, but I left my clicker at home and I took notes on the paper and I wrote down the clicker question and the you answer did. that I put. <laughs> That's a little yeah. Bad, but, but you're here pretty much every day, right? Um, I've missed Ooh. Yeah. Well, see, the thing is, you have to, yeah, you have to have your, you have to have your um, clicker with you in class to participate. I mean, that doesn't sound very smart, but I mean, it, yeah. I mean, technically. Yeah. So, um, so, and, but usually a student has one or two lectures to burn. Okay. So, um, now I'm gonna.